Our third speaker is Chizuko Uino from University Tokyo, and her title of her paper is The Coming of the New Class Society, Gender Matters. Chizuko. I'm a small woman like Sarah, Digital artist, I make myself higher with a step. <laughs> and I, I notice, Michael, you are tough to others, but not to yourself. <laughs> it is my great honor to be on the president, uh, presidential plenary, though I'd not necessarily represent Japanese sociologists as women, especially gender studies scholars, still remain as a minority in the academic community like everywhere else. Nevertheless, it may be an appropriate choice for this panel because gender is the main variable for inequality. I must begin my speech with referring to the tragic disaster which Japan experienced three years ago on March 11th. A big earthquake attacked the northeast coast of Japanese island which followed the gigantic wave called a tsunami, more than 15,000 people were dead and missed by this natural disaster, leaving survivors with traumatic experiences. Worse than that was an accident of the nuclear power plants in Fukushima caused by the human error. There is no excuse because the accident had been warned and even predicted by conscience scholars since many years ago, and the electric company had a chance to prevent it. Now Japan has been exposed to the nuclear radiation three times in the history, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and then Fukushima. In the in the last case, there is no one else to blame other than ourselves, which has brought a serious depression among intellectuals and the citizens. Many thought Japan must change. The victimized regime, uh, regions were depicted as a symbol of the local community with the aging population and the declining industry. The earthquake and the tsunami have accelerated the speed of disintegration of these communities that were already cornered. Particularly in Fukushima, with the fear of nuclear radiation, youth and parents, especially mothers with young children, are evacuated uh, of, from their hometowns, leaving their old parents behind. The disaster divides families and the communities by age and gender. The Japanese society has entered into the stage of population decrease with rapid aging and extremely low fertility, 1.26, the lowest in 2005. This must be the time to downshift the gear towards a more matured society, however, the current political administration still seeks for the fantasy of economic growth, I would call it a illusion, namely Abenomics. Based on the success experience of the past, they take advantage of the damage of the disaster as an excuse of generous public investment for construction in the name of recovery, only to increase financial debt. The Japanese government is now indebted at the scale, three times as big as the state budget. Japan now suffers from the two in debts, both in finance and in trade. Who is responsible for this miserable result? And who pays the price? In order to answer these questions, let me go back to the history in some decades ago. The year of 1991 was noted for the collapse of the bubble economy. It was also noted at the year of the end of the Cold War with the disintegration of the Soviet Union. 
Japan was thrown into the globalization in the midst of the economic recession up until then. Japan had enjoyed the prosperity boasting of the Japanese style management and the traditional Japanese family system, while the other advanced industrial societies struggled for structural changes. In order to survive in the global competition, the Japanese government, together with employers' association, decided to victimize women and youth by loosening labor regulations one after another under uh, the neoliberalist reform, the labor unionists gave agreement as far as it protected their status quo. The deregulation of employment has been promoted in the past three decades, which resulted in the increase of irregular workers such as part-time, dispatch, contract, and temporary workers. Today, 38% of the entire labor force are irregular workers, 21% among men, 58% among women. Among youth in the age group between 15 and 24, 46 among men and 57% among women are irregular. Nearly half of new school leavers are thrown into the irregular labor market from the beginning of their career to be called precariat. The problem of irregular employment in Japan is special. First, there is a huge wave gap between regular and irregular employment. Secondly, there is no job security with irregular workers where they have no vision for career development. Thirdly, the medical insurance and the unemployment security is not applied to most irregular workers. The income level of irregular employment is often lower than the social security level. To be called working poor, even though they work standard working hours. In the early stage of the depression, the irregular employment was considered as the temporary passage to the regular employment, especially for youth. But as the recession lasted longer than expected, their situation tends to be fixed as to consist the bottom of the labor market where they will remain for their lifetime. Japan is now a class society with a widening class gap, the title of this presentation, The Coming of the New Class Society, is derived from the Daniel Bell's book, The Coming of the Post-Industrial Society, in 1973. His prediction turned out to be true, with gender inequality restructured. In the 70s, after the rapid economic growth, the Japanese society was to be called as a middle-class society with the second lowest income gap between the top and the bottom next to Sweden, where more than 80% of the nation answered yes to the question whether they belong to the middle class. This thick strata of middle class served as a stabilizer of the Japanese system in 30 years. This middle class was bipolarized between the small elite and majority of the lower class, with the second biggest income gap between the top and the bottom next to the United States among the OECD countries. What has made this change? Who is responsible for this human-made error? My answer is that it is the made alliance among politicians, bureaucrats, employers, and labor unionists who are responsible for this outcome because they made an agreement to promote the class gap. It's also an alliance between neoliberalism and neoconservatism, which is common with other countries. The current Abe 
administration is typical in the combination of neoliberalist reform and aggressive neo-nationalism, easy to understand. Women and youth, to be worse, young women, have been victimized. They are the ones who are forced to pay the price of the neoliberalist reform. The price is also high for the society because it resulted in the low fertility, which ended up with a decreasing labor market and the consumer market. An interesting survey conducted by a governmental research institute shows that women with secured regular jobs are more likely to get married than to give birth compared with those with irregular employment. The findings tell us if the government wishes to increase fertility, they do better provide young women with secured jobs. Despite the lesson, the current neoliberalist reform goes to the opposite direction. We now have a class gap among men as well as among women. Gender gap is worse. I have struggled as a feminist activist scholar for past 40 years, for most of my lifetime since the 70s, when we experienced the global simultaneity of the second wave feminism. Such a question whether Japanese women's status have been improved in the past 40 years has been what it would be embarrassing to me as it is very difficult to answer. If you take a look at the global ranking, Japan is ranked at the third in GDP and eighth in Human Development Index. But once gender is introduced, it goes down to the 58th in the gender empowerment measurement and lower down to 105th in gender gap index, recently going lower down to 108th in among 135 countries, due mainly to the fact that women's representation in the decision-making position is very poor. Since the ratification of the UN Treaty of Elimination of all the forms of women's discrimination, women's status in most developed countries have been improved, leaving Japan as exceptional. What explains this uniqueness of Japanese women's low status? Is it the Japanese cultural tradition of family system or traditional obedient nature of Japanese women? Culture does not serve as a sociological variable as it is a black box with no definition. My analysis is simple but hopefully persuasive. Unlike other developed countries where migrant labor is available for the reserve army of labor force, Japan lacks the substantial presence of foreign workers with a strict immigration control. In this context, Japanese women substitute migrant workers as the disposable workers at the bottom of the labor force. In other words, gender serves as a functional equivalent with race and ethnicity in other developed countries. This lack of migrant workers in unskilled jobs caused the various problems of Japanese society, the lack of care workers for afraid elderly people, the lack of caregivers for children of working mothers, outsourcing of the care burden or reproductive labor can be a solution for working mothers in Southeast Asia, such as Singapore and Hong Kong. The solution is not available for Japanese women. In Europe and in the US as well, it is racial and ethnic minorities who serve as care workers. Though the government, together with some elite women, insist to introduce domestic workers from abroad since there are other Asian countries such as the Philippines, 
and Indonesia, with a strong population pressure to export workers, I do not think it is appropriate to solve the care issue at the price of other minority women. Well, I'd follow your order. <laughs> okay. The territory and the population and the two most important wealth for the modern nation state. Now, the Japanese government. Uh, okay, let's see. Well, it is headed towards the population policy, which once was tabooed. It also tries to reform the Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution so as to send Japanese military beyond the territory to compete with. Superpowers. But what's wrong with the population decrease? This is about the time to wake up from the elusive fantasy of growth both in population and power. Instead, we learned from March 11. What we learned from March 11 is Japan must change. The scenario has been already made towards the redistribution of social risks. Just as Guy Standing told us, namely, social solidarity, where women can take a great part. Anti-nuclear power and anti-militarism is the presumed condition. In the end, let me close my speech with the hope that it is not too late. Thank you very much.